On February 25th, Saturday this week, Nigerians will head to the polls to elect a number of officials. This include state assemblies, members of the House of Representatives, senators, governors. But of course, all eyes will be focused on the election of the President of the Republic. We know that the outgoing, the outgoing President, President Muhammadu Buhari, has served his constitutionally mandated maximum of, of four, uh, of maximum of, pardon me, he served his constitutionally mandated two terms uh, of each four years. He's exiting, he had been the leader of the All Progressives Party, and he is now leaving that position, creating the space for about a field of 18 major candidates who are vying for that position. But four of them really stand out. This include Mr. Bola Tinubu, former governor of Lagos State, Mr. Atiku Abubakar, who's a former vice president representing the People's Democratic Party, Mr. Peter Obi of the Labour Party and the former governor of the Anambra State, as well as Mr. Rabiu Kwankaso of the new Nigerian People's Party and the former governor of Kano State. Nigeria is the most important country in the sub-region. It's also the most populated country on the continent with 200 million, over 200 million people. It is the largest oil producing country on the continent as well as the largest economy in Africa. This means that what happens in Nigeria matters. My name is Mvemba Pezo Dizolele. I'm the Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Considering the importance of these elections, I'm joined today by one of the foremost experts on Nigerian politics and development, Ms. Yemi Adamo Lekun, who's Executive Director of Enough is Enough Nigeria. Yemi, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I'm not sure about being an expert, but certainly happy to talk about Nigeria. You are an expert and thank you for joining us. What is the state of the electoral process in Nigeria as you head to the elections? Well, today is Tuesday. Elections, as you said, are on Saturday. Campaigns will end Thursday night. Interestingly, uh, Tinumbu, the APC candidate, is having his final rally in Lagos today. Atiku, I believe, had his final rally in Adamawa on Saturday. So they're winding down their campaigns as we head to the polls. What's also been very interesting is the proliferation of surveys and opinion polls that have come into play over the last one week. I think one was released today. Probably will be the final one if another one doesn't show up tomorrow. And then really just people getting, getting ready, getting ready for, in Nigeria, we shut down the whole country for elections. So there's uh, no movement. You basically can only walk to your polling units and then go back home and follow what else is happening. So that's interesting. And then at the back of that is the challenges that we faced over the last few months on full scarcity and the redesign of our currency, which has caused major, major problems across the country. So I think those really will be the, what I would say will be the highlights of sort of the context of, of where we are as people get ready for elections. The strength of the electoral process, is it one that is, is conducive to trust? Uh, the uh, registration and the PVC card delivery and so on, they did instill trust uh, in the, the, the electorate in Nigeria. Well, I think yes and no. So the PVC process was very challenging and there are several allegations of voter suppression through that process. Either people finding it very difficult to pick up their PVCs or being told that their PVCs were not printed, that they will then be printed, but they, at least as I, as I know as of today, they haven't gotten any word back from the election management body. And then the election management body had quite a, an interesting posture of saying, well, if we distributed 80% of the cards, we've done well. So it raises another issue of, well, there are then 12% of the population that are disenfranchised. What does that mean for them? So yes, the number looks good, but there are people who cannot vote, and that is quite important. However, on the other side of trust, 
is the fact that technology is now part of our legal framework. So the election management body is allowed to use any technology that it deems necessary for conducting elections. And so this time around, we have what is called the a verification system, the bimodal voter authentication system, which allows you to be verified with your facial features or with your fingerprints. And unlike previous elections, when there was a possibility for manual override, so if you are not authentic, if you are not authenticated electronically, there's a, what we we'll call an incidence form that just allows the electoral officer to write down the fact that you were there. And that was manipulated in many different ways. So the fact that right now, if you're not authenticated by that piece of machine, you cannot vote. It doesn't matter the fact that you are physically standing there. It doesn't matter that you have your permanent voters card. It doesn't matter that you are actually listed in the voters register and you can point to yourself that, look, that's me. As long as the device doesn't authenticate you or verify you, you will not be able to vote. And there's quite a bit of excitement around what that means for the election and what that means for sort of curbing duplicate votes or people voting in places that they're not really registered. People voting by proxy, let me, let me use it that way. And then thirdly, the fact that results will be transmitted electronically. So in as much as we still have a manual process <clears throat> of collating results through the different sort of stages or different uh, layers of the country, it also will be transmitted electronically, which then means, and that is on a portal that every citizen has access to. So you literally can watch the results as they are uploaded by the electoral management body. So I think some of those things that give people some kind of hope in the process that we, that it might be different. It'll be the first time that we'll have an election that has this level of technology, if I want to use that word. So it'll be interesting to see how, how it plays out. The, um, those kind of challenges certainly corrode the level of trust that pe people put in the system. Do you think there was enough recourse from the electorate to address those issues? So, sorry, say that again? Those kind of issues can corrode trust in the process. So given that the INEC had said that if they register 80%, that's good enough. Were there other recourses for the electorate that might have felt frustrated by that? Certainly. I mean, I don't, I don't think for anybody who wants to vote, even if it's one vote, I want to vote. So I really don't care if you register, if you have 88% PPC collection or 99.5. As long as I am not able to vote for that particular person, then that's, that's a relative the important issue. And for Nigeria, it was particular, I think I would say Lagos, and I can speak for Lagos because we try to engage in the process here. Because in Lagos, the, the cards came in quite late, even by INEC's own admission. So if you started PVC collection two months prior, and our cards literally come in a week before it ends, there should be some concession around people's ability to pick up their cards, which was not provided. Now, what then happens after elections, I don't know. But a big part of the conversation that we certainly would have is the need for that piece of plastic to, uh, what's it called, to make you an elig eligible voter. Because if your data is on INEX database and you can show another piece of government ID, a passport, a driver's license, an ID card, a national identity uh, number or, or a slip, which is what is being distributed, anything issued by government that can show who you are and verify that you're a Nigerian citizen, that can be corroborated with your presence on the voters register should allow a Nigerian to vote. And that certainly will be an advocacy point after the elections. Quite a challenge there. We'd like to welcome Ayadat Hassan, who's just joined us. Ayadat is the director of the Center for Democracy and Development based in Abuja. Adayat, what is your assessment of the electoral process at this point, as we lead to the elections? Um. So far, so good. It's been it's been exciting, it's been interesting, and at times it's been a bit worrying. So it's a bit it's a bit of a mismatch really for us because as Nigerians, we are hedging to go to the polls, we are hedging to actually uh, exercise our franchise. 
on Saturday. And these elections are quite important for us for a lot of reasons. It goes beyond the fact that it's going to represent 24 years of unbroken democracy, the longest in the history of the country. But importantly, the fact that you have a three horse race compared to the, so you have a choice, not now to say that this is a choice between the devil and the deep blue sea. You have a lot of choices to actually make in these elections itself. Uh, itself. So it's it's interesting for Nigerians and with the increase in the number of registered voters. But what's really worrying is that like four days into the elections, all of a sudden we are very worried. We are worried that the election administration itself might be impacted by the Naira swap, the demonetization policy, which of course entailed the changing of the color of Naira, like we say it's locally here. But this Naira has become extremely scarce to Nigerians. They don't have access to Naira. You have money in bank, but you don't have physical cash to spend. This is not a cashless economy. This Most of the economy is actually cash-based, particularly when you get from the urban to the rural areas. So as ordinary citizens, people are suffering, and many people would not be able to travel to vote. But also at the same time, we know that institutions are quite important. And there are lots of instit institutions that will be involved in these elections. The election management body, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, is just one of that. The security agencies, like almost 25 of them, coming together under the uh, auspices of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. We also need cash. And if you have heard about the story of Nigeria, that we are experiencing an epidemic of insecurity from the jihadi insurgency of the Islamic State in the West African province, or its sister organization, the Boko Haram, to the bandits, to separationist agitation, to kidnapping, all forms of violent conflict ongoing in the country. Just are prevailing insecurity aside the political violence. You need a lot of security forces. We don't even know if we have enough to curtail this insecurity on, it, on election day so that people can freely exercise their franchise. And you still have us as observers who need money to also deploy in, on the field, as well as citizens who often travel from one place to the other to vote. In Nigeria, so if you are from uh, Lagos, most people go back to Lagos to vote during the elections, irrespective of living all their lives, actually here in Abuja and even paying taxes in Abuja. The old Naira swap principle have now changed the context of the elections. And it's worrying because it will actually impact the quality of the elections, one in which for the first time Nigerians are having a bit of confidence that the elections might be a bit improved, credible, and above all, it is an opportunity for them to renegotiate development in this country. So there are lots, as much as there are excitement, there are indeed worries. And these worries do have a lot of implication for what we will actually see on election day. This might be external challenges, but these external challenges will definitely contribute to other internal challenges that might impact the elections. Considering all these challenges, Adayat, why did the government, I presume this is a decision that was taken through the central bank, but through the executive, uh, why did that decision come just as Nigerians are going to the poll uh, for such a critical, uh, at this, such a critical juncture? I think it's really, it's a fact that we don't know. There are lots of speculations, but one thing we've all come to an agreement uh, on is that this is to cop wood buying. But in the real sense, will it cop wood buying? I doubt that. Uh, I think it will actually make wood buying to become cheaper because here everybody needs some cash really in their hands. So I think it's ill-planned, it's not well-planned, it's ill-timed, and it shouldn't be something that would actually have happened here. Other countries here in Africa have also done a Naira swap. They've demonetized their currency. They have not gone through what Nigeria is currently experiencing with this whole uh, policy. Beyond the Naira swap, how do you assess these elections to be different from the previous ones? 
These elections are different for a host of reasons. These elections are different because of the excitement that we can actually feel in the land, really. These elections are not one where, it's one where Nigerians are quite enthusiastic to participate in the elections. It goes beyond the youth, the young people. It includes the citizens. Finally, in the history of this country, having followed at least four electoral circle, Nigerians now know that votes do have consequences. And this knowledge is actually driving the kind of excitement and the, kind, the participation we are seeing in this election. The introduction of technology has also imbued some trust in the whole electoral process. So with the technology, Nigerians are viewing it more like a silver bullet, which will lead to improved, improved uh, electoral system. They believe you can go to the INEC result viewing platform and as a citizen, you can start looking at the vote, starting from your polling unit, to be sure that it's actually conformed to reality on one hand. On the other hand, you still have Nigerians believing that this beavers is one that will not allow for double multiple voting because it authenticates your biometrics, but above all, it doesn't allow for the use of the incidents form because with the smart card reader, which of course led to the change in administration in 2015. You could actually still use the incident form. Now, if you cannot be captured either using facial recognition, your facial, your biometrics, your facial biometrics, your fingerprint will actually work in this. So this itself, this technology, the signing of the new electoral act, which has also addressed some of our advocacy concerns advocacy issues in the last years have also imbued confidence in the whole system. So irrespective that this elections is driven by lots of challenges you can think of. You can think of the insecurity itself, you can think of the demonetization, you can think of everything, but even the mere fact that we have an option and we have moved from a two dominant party state to one where there are equally important party who are able to secure a win at the national level, but the same is also obtainable at the sub-national level. The story of Nigerian elections, these 2023 elections people often do not state, is that it's the same way we've seen the emergence of the third force at the national level, that there have also emerged other third forces at the state level, at the sub-national level. So you might expect to see a governor who is not on the platform of either of these four parties. You expect to see more parliamentarians emerge, which will start making people believe that not only do their vote count, but maybe you don't have to have enough watches, so much watches to get elected into office. In terms of, um, you know, there are always these different regional differences in Nigeria. One is faith, the other one is just regional ethnicity and so on. Yemi, how is that panning out this time? You are muted, I think, Yemi. Yes. It's the first election since 1979 that we've had a representation from Nigeria's old, along Nigeria's old regional lines. So Northern Nigeria, Western Nigeria, and Eastern Nigeria. And I think in a lot of ways for a certain generation, that's a very big deal in terms of who they vote for. Uh, for quite a number of younger Nigerians, it's not as important. So, so you can have, a, so if we take three parameters, age, religion, and ethnicity, for a lot of younger Nigerians, ethnicity is not a big deal. Neither is really religion in as, as much as really wanting a, a, young, a young person that they feel they can relate to. But for another demographic of Nigerian, ethnicity and religion do play very important roles. And of course, we're making broad statements here. The young Nigerians where ethnicity and religion would, would play a role. But I would think on average, it would seem that age is a more important part. Now, obviously, these are we're then talking of people who are outside political parties. So people who are diehard party members would, for the most part, align with their party's choice. But for those who are just citizens, who are just going to the polls, that would be the sort of the general lay of the land. 
And then religion is, a, is an issue that cannot really be swept away. So if you speak to, for example, those who are in the North Central or someone who's from Southern Kaduna who's a Christian, given their lived experiences of terror in what would seem to be a tag, very targeted based on their faith, the thought of a Muslim, Muslim ticket that uh, Tinubu's party represents, or the one that's top of ticket a Muslim that Atiku's party represents, are not parties that they're interested in for those reasons. Again, broad general, generalizations, but really the sentiments that come through in conversations, sentiments that come through in surveys that have been collect, con conducted by different bodies. And really, even if you look at the candidates themselves and how they choose to appeal to Nigerians. So the conversation you're having in a mosque or a church would be slightly different than your more public posture to, to Nigerians. So it'll be interesting to see how, but what is clear though is despite all the talk about issues and, and the people, the people are not separated from their ethnicity or their religion or their age in that sense. So do the selections of the ticket you know, we know that um, Tinubu, for instance, ticket is Muslim Muslim. You referred to that. Um, Peter Obi is a Christian Muslim. And um, Rabiu Kwankaso is Muslim Muslim, if exactly if I'm, if I'm correct. Are those playing out at all within those conversations? I know you talked about the general uh, sense of it. But it's also kind of a gentleman agreement that existed among Nigerians, at least among the political elite, that they will be transferred from Christian to, to Muslim and also north to south. Is that still <clears throat> one of the drivers of, of the political scene in this context? It is very much so. I think for those who, and I think it is an interesting part about, so the north, for example, has one candidate, whereas the south has two. So in the conversation around, if Buhari is from the north, so if we're doing the rotation, it should come to the south. And so the question then becomes in the south, who is, the, who is my choice and why? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would speak to older Yoruba people and who are, who, whose ethnic biases are very clear. And they make no apologies for it. They're clear that it's the time of the south, so they don't, they're not interested in voting for a Fulani candidate and of a Yoruba and Igbo candidates that represent the South. They are Yoruba, therefore they will vote for the Yoruba candidate. So we're not discussing the issues of if your candidate is competent, if he can lead you into the future, all of that is sort of secondary. It's just very clear around, these are the options that have been given. And based on what is important to me, this is how I'm going to vote. And it, also if you look at it in, in that sense, I mean, for eight years of the Buhari presidency, for those who cannot imagine yet another, in a sense, the northern part of Nigeria holding power for another four years, it's also that clear around why. So I think it's it's important that we don't shy away from the fact that some of the choices that people are making are really that. I don't want to call them shallow because in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society, people's sense of their, their place and their rights within the country are extremely important, especially where you don't think the country is, has been governed in a fair way. So you're making choices that you believe are in your own self-interest, so to speak, which then goes really to part of the conversation that we should be having, that we're not having, how we're a federation in name, but not in practice. And what do you mean in name and not in practice? Well, we're called the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I know you are, but you're also voting for governors and so on. This is also happening now. Yeah, well, that one is another election in, oh, pardon me, that was election in, in two weeks. But it's not, um, it's, we're Federal Republic in name, but I think in practice we're more of a unitary state. So our military history plays very much in how we are governed and we, the way our institutions, so for example, our police are federal, our, uh, well, so our police are federal, a lot of our agencies are, are federal, and we share money federally. Everybody kind of generates money from their state, sends it to the center, and then the center reshares it and gives you back your share of it. Whereas technically, states should 
generate their own money and send the center a little bit of it to be used for defense and all the other things. So because that's the case, the center has a lot of power and there's a lot of attention focus on the president, you're quite right. So even though on Saturday, we're voting not only for the president, we're also voting for members of the National Assembly that technically make our laws. The conversation is like 95% of five dominated by who is president, which is a testament to how powerful the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is. Very good. So one such candidate is Peter Obi, who the world yes. considered today an insurgent candidate. I think we see that this is the first time since 1979 that a third force contender is taken very seriously. He doesn't uh, have the same structure as the, all the other candidates, uh, PDP and APC. But we see that a, lot, a large number of people follow him, particularly the youth, and that has been across the country. Adayat, what does this insurgency mean, if we can call it uh, that? And how is that playing out again on, on the ground? It's been interesting. I think it's been interesting. It's energized the contest. I, in particular, would say I'm excited because without an OB or a Kokonso on the ticket, on the ballot, and coming as frontliner, it would have been boring. And even this projected improved turnout, if we get it, might not have actually happened. So be as energized the young people um, online and of course offline. And it's also helped to shape the discussion really in these elections because here we are not just talking about, we are talking, we are now looking. In fact, more and more we are beginning to look into what each of the candidates are bringing to the table uh, with Peter Obi. And I think his agility, his youthfulness, the fact that he's 61, in a contest where the oldest is 76, the other is 70, and the next to uh, the third is 66, with a 61. For in a, it's actually it also makes him something that people can actually somebody that young people can relate with. Uh, his whole austere man is also very good, especially to people because from first and foremost you are seeing somebody that people have not known in the last three years to carry his bag and and what is it uh, fly on in a, on economy ticket locally it's nothing it's not like this is manufactured last minute into the elections this is something people have known so he's been able to bring a kind of excitement and he's able to form a movement because this is actually uh, insurgency but it's actually a movement it's not really like a political party coalition that all the other people are governizing around interest. And I think whichever way he wins, he doesn't, he has actually changed the face of Nigeria's politics. And above all, he has given the dominant party a vote for their money in these elections. So and he has thrown into his partner to the ability to predict who will actually win these elections. Besides his age, he's 61, uh, I presume the average age in Nigeria is still, what, 19, like uh, the rest of the continent, about there, 18, 19, maybe 17. So there's still a gap there with the youth. So what is it that the youth see in him that attract them to him? Because we've seen these pictures across, again, throughout Nigeria where he's travel, the throngs of young people following him. What do they see? I think it's also his ability to relate with the young people. Uh, he's not offish. You see him when he's going on his campaign, he's there openly, he's not eating from anybody, he's relating. Then the bulk of his campaign are also led by young people. I think maybe that's the point we should make. Aside from the older generation, he has a lot of young people. And because it's movement, because of the online, where everybody feels like Obi, they are contesting for the elections through Obi. They are not, it's not just Obi that is contesting. Some of these young people are contesting, they are vying this election, in these elections alongside Obi. But what is important to underline at every point is that young people in Nigeria is not monolithic. It's an heterogeneous category. 
And while some call the obedient and supporting Obi, we also equally have fanatical following for Rabbi Musa Kwekwen So who is also another thought force, a fourth one, a, spoil, a possible spoiler in this race, considering the love the young people have for him in the ancient city of Kanu, Nigeria's vote bank, and across and pockets of um, northern Nigeria. At the same time, some of these young people are batified following Bola Ahmed Tinubu of APC, while the others are articulated in supporting Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party. But the difference is that the obedient are very, very vocal. They believe in what they are doing. They are not silent or shy trumpers here. They are extremely expressive and they are supporting their candidate with any and everything that they have gotten. So, Yemi, um, Adaya just described some of the drivers, the attraction to, to uh, Peter Obi, particularly from the youth. The, uh, the youth. With Kwanka, so what is making him strong and what is his base? I mean, Adaya spoke to that as well. I mean, Kano. I think, well, Lagos probably has now the largest voting voting numbers, but lots of registered voters in Kano. Historic uh, decider in some elections. But I think what's clear is that Kwakoso doesn't have a chance. So it's literally, when we would mention four candidates, and I always say that I like to mention Yeli Shuwari as well, uh, not because he, he has a chance in terms of numbers, but he's been, at least in the last two election cycle, very consistent about being anti-establishment very clear that if you really want a change, a departure from what is, then you need to pick someone that's not, has never been, and is not part of the dominant parties. Peter Obi was a member of the PDP. Rabbi Mpapaso has been both members of APC and PDP. So in that context, his point is that they're not really very different because they were, in a sense, they've been part of those parties. But Rabbi Mpapaso, I mean, doesn't have a chance, in my opinion, and I think every, Pretty much everybody that's following Nigeria's politics would agree in terms of being president. But he does have a very real chance of uh, influencing who becomes the governor of Kano State, where he has served as a two-term governor. But also in terms of the votes in the north, um, there's been a lot of speculation that he would, in a sense, align with either Itinubu or Anatiku uh, to sort of throw his weight behind them, since he knows that his votes will not count for much. There's something to be leveraged in that if it's a trade, through my votes, votes behind you for Kano, put an unquote, for example. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, but it's also very interesting in his, in his own campaign style. So he obviously is not as wealthy as a Tinubu or an Atiku, but he has spent his time campaigning in the smaller villages that a lot of the bigger candidates did not go to. So going by road from small village to small village and spending time with people and people who get into scene. So it becomes to, like it becomes to a state, he won't do a big rally in the capital city, but he will go to the smaller, kind of smaller towns in mm -hmm. the state. And I think that'll be very interesting to see how that translates into numbers for him. Uh, and it'll be a good lesson in terms of campaign strategy if, if it does translate into numbers. So four of those main, uh, three of the main candidates we're discussing today are former governors. Um, does this add any value? The governor is closer to people, it's compared to, we'll talk about Abu Bakar Atiku in a little bit. Uh, you did mention wealth with uh, Tinubu. Tinubu for a long time was considered the kingmaker. Now the kingmaker wants to be king himself. So what is the role of this experience as governor play in this, in this space here as they vying for the presidency? I think for Tinumbu, slightly different than uh, a Peter Obi. Tinumbu, as you said, a kingmaker. So in Lagos politics, not only was he a two-term governor, he has successfully, in a, in a sense, literally chosen his successors. And there have been two, uh, the third one is currently vying for his own second term. Not only that in terms of politics, but also, quite frankly, in terms of the economy of Lagos State. Uh, I'm still waiting for the expose that will be done at some point that would fully show the length and breadth of Tinumbu's involvement in Lagos State, both in terms of businesses, real estate, assets, 
um, not only physically, but also in terms of the state treasury and what that has done for his political career over the last, I don't know, 20, 20 odd years. Now for Peter, while there are some high points around his governorship in Anambra, I think a lot more people have said that uh, another fellow governor of his, Chris Ngigi, probably did a lot more than he did when he was governor. So his record as governor in Anambra is not as strong, without a shadow of a doubt, as, as Tinubu's, uh, Tinubu's is was. And part of the joke with Tinubu's candidature is that people are hoping for the Tinubu of 20 years ago, but age has, has taken a toll on, his, on, him, on him, as we've seen as he's gone through the campaign. But it's interesting when you speak to sort of diehard Tinubu voters, they, the, there's an English word for this which escapes me at the moment. English is not my first language. But there's a, a nostalgia, that's it, that's the word, okay. for a Tinubu of 20 years ago and what he was able to do and establish and establishing Lagos. Then for Rabiu Kwakwan who was governor of Kano, I think same thing. I mean, he even in his campaign, he references quite a lot what he did in Kano. And he uses that quite uh, a lot about saying, we did this in Kano, we can do this in Nigeria. I did this in Kano, I can do this in Nigeria. But the three different men, very interestingly enough, one a northern governor, one a uh, western governor, one an eastern governor, the one whose imprint on his state as far outlasted his tenure as government is Tinubu without a doubt. And it's also very interesting if you parallel that with what you said earlier about followers and support. So you see that in Tinubu supporters, Lagosians and then Southwesterners more generally. You see that in Kwakwansu supporters, the Kwakwansia movement, Red Cap, very ardent followers. You don't see that with Peter Obi. So Peter Obi has gotten a new set of followers in young people who are passionate about his candidature, what he represents. Um, as Hidayat said, who are very vocal online, and I dare say slightly intolerant of others who don't like their candidates in their, in their being vocal, uh, which is fine. I mean, you can like your candidate, but that doesn't mean that everybody who doesn't like him is, is some of the unprintable words that, that they do share. But also for me, it's an interesting dynamic about the sort of online, offline community around Beethoven. So very vocal online, but also because it's online, you can't really say how many people are in Nigeria or supporting from the diaspora because it's, it's a hope that Peter represents of a Nigeria that they want to see. And so for them, because unfortunately, we don't have diaspora voting, this is how they play. <clears throat> this is how they come and are part of this engagement is fully supporting Peter in the space that allows them to do that. They can't attend a rally. They can't do door-to-door -door campaigning for him. They can't vote for him. But on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any online space that you give them, they can put in their full weight, their time. I mean, there's some Twitter spaces of obedience that are six hours, seven hours, eight hours long. Literally, his supporters just talking about different issues, analyzing different issues, talking about, I mean, it's, it's been, as Zidai had said, been absolutely fascinating. And it'll be really very interesting to see how, how that translates in, uh, on Saturday. Very fascinating indeed. So Adayat, the one candidate we've not spent a lot of time on, who was not a former governor, who has no track record in that space, but he was a vice president, and that's Atiku Abubakar. Where does he stand in this, on this chessboard? What are his strengths? Uh, he often says that he saved the constitution last time when uh, he was vice president, President Obasanjo was trying to, to stay a little longer than the constitution mandated. Uh, that's one thing he often points out to. But where does he stand? What is his track record? I, Article Bubaka, interestingly, he's also a consummate uh, politician. The three, three out of the four, in fact, all the four candidates are known to each other. They are friends. They have all been previously friends. They've all actively participated in the Nigerian electoral process since 1999. Uh, only that three of them started politics together in 1993, which uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar also belonged to that group, having vied for the presidential ticket of the Social Democratic Party, which he lost in the first round to the now acclaimed, later acclaimed winner of the 1993 elections, Moshut Kashima Wabiola. Uh, in, and in 1999, he came up to be 
uh, the vice president of Nigeria between 1999 and 2007. And, 2007. and since then, he claimed that, of course, he worked towards ensuring he oversaw the privatization process the privatization process of the whole of Nigeria during that period, a process where pundits have also claimed that he used to enrich himself, illegally enrich himself. But there has been no court of competent jurisdiction that has adjudged him as guilty of these charges. Atiku Abubakar is seen to be a unifier. It's uh, a unifier, a national unifier, a national politicians with friends across all the 36 states of Nigeria and the FCT. He has been able to not just build uh, a business, a business, of course, a consummate businessman, thriving businesses, but he's been friendly and he's campaigning on this rebuilding Nigeria, reuniting the host, uh, the country, the unifier. He's married to women from across all the major ethnic grouping of Nigeria. Previously was married to an Igbo woman, married to a um, Yoruba woman, as well as, of course, to Northerners as well, which he, of course, shows his acceptability. While he's a Muslim and running a Muslim Christian ticket, it's also important to note that in spite of him actually being that, he seemed to be a tolerant Muslim. In fact, some of the things that is currently being used against him was during his time in office, he did not support the Sharia policy, which he of course brought the introduction of religion into a country which is meant, where, which our constitution prescribes must be a secular one. And he refused to be referred to as a large, but he said Vice President Atiko Abubakar. Uh, but at 76 years old, um, running for the sixth time because he ran in 2007, he ran. Uh, he tried. He ran in 2007. He ran unsuccessfully at the party uh, uh, during the party primaries in 2011. He ran in 2015 at the APC party primaries against. Uh, General Muhammadu uh, Buhari, he ran again as the presidential flag bearer of um, PDP in the 2019 elections. So if we take this electoral circle, he's running the fifth time without adding the 1993. So we hope, will it be fifth time this lucky? But what is working for him really is the fact that his, his party does have structures. What, which is what? The ground game across all the 176,846 polling units of the country. The fact that is the only northerner in the race is also from the northeast of Nigeria, who equally have not produced any precedent compared to the northwest or the southwest of the country. And he will be taking a sizable number or he will be sharing with Bola Ahmed the number of the All Progressive Congress, the votes from Northern Nigeria. And I think a point to highlight here is that 43% of the total registered number uh, uh, voters are from the Northwest and the Southwest of the country. And this important part of the country will be determining who actually wins the votes. If we assume that insecurity and banditry and all the other challenges that come with that do not interrupt the process, that come Saturday people vote and across the board it's somewhat acceptable, do you, both of you, see the country going into a runoff because just the way you described everybody pulling their own share of the electorate to their side. Um, how, what's your read on that? We'll start with Yemi. Uh, you muted again. Okay, sorry. I don't know if I'm on mute button. I mean, we, we sponsored a poll by SBM Intelligence that its end result was that it was too close to call and it will go to a runoff. I mean, as I say, polls are what people tell you. So it's a reflection of either they are lying or they tell you the truth. And for all the major polls that have been done, including ours, ANAP Foundation, um, STEERS, the common denominator 
is that you have a lot of people who claim to be undecided and who also choose not to tell you who they're going to vote for. The ones who claim to be undecided, I personally don't believe them. So if you add the percentage of those who claim to be undecided to those who choose not to tell you who they're going to vote for, it skews the numbers quite enough that whatever you get for the others are debatable. But I think polling is an interesting exercise. And I, uh, the joke in my office at the moment is that we're all waiting for the INEC poll, live poll, that will happen on Saturday. <laughs> so in, in that regard, to be honest, I think on that one, I would agree with what Idaya said at the very beginning of the conversation, that it, the dynamics are very different from what they've been in terms of voting patterns. So the two dominant parties understood how people voted, understood where their supporters were, understood where, if they could, they could instigate violence, orchestrate voter suppression, either through the registration process uh, or in other ways. And which is why you history. I mean, as someone says, if you keep telling people their votes are not going to count or there's going to be violence or there's going to be rigging, at some point you're like, why should I bother? So if you continue, if you push out a narrative of a sort that the process is not going to yield what you want, you invariably dissuade people from participating in the process. But the interesting part about this election will be, would that change? Would people be this invested in something new enough that despite claims of violence, despite uh, concerns about what might or what might not be, that people do come out in their numbers and vote? But what we do know to be true is that with lower voter turnout, it's easier for your main parties to kind of shape the outcome of elections based on voting patterns and how they know um, who, how, how much they pay attention to who participates in the process. But if you have a higher voter turnout for whatever reason, your educated elites choose to come out, your urban players choose to leave their homes watching TV to play, people who have had mixed experiences under this administration decide they want to vote a different way just because. Um, people have done a lot of work on the ground, educating citizens, mobilizing them to participate in the process. All of that, we really don't know how it shapes up till Saturday. So will we have a runoff? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but yeah, we'll find out soon enough. Well, well we'll find out. Adayat, what's your read of that? Oh, thank you very much. I think that I'm of the group that believes that maybe it's too close to call. At this point, we do not know who will win the elections, but the likelihood of a runoff are actually unlikely. But maybe 80% I'll say there will be no runoff. Now, there are two critical things that will actually define the polls itself. One, and importantly, would be who inherits the 12 million votes of former President Buhari. This 12 million votes does not belong to his party. These are his own votes. The second issue will be how will the 14 states who historically since 1999 have always voted PDP, the People's Democratic Party, how they would vote in these elections. These two issues will be critical beyond the, who has got the highest number of registered voters and who has got the history of turnout in these elections. And of course, uh, this will determine what the outcome will look really like. It will be very close. It will be very close. There will be a lot of ups up upsets. It should not, our focus should not just be looking at the presidential race, but looking at the parliamentary races that will actually be having, happening during that elections. We are going to be having electing new senators and new House of Representative members who will be at the national uh, parliament, our own Nigeria National Assembly itself. The flavor, what parties are actually people being elected from will go a lot in terms of instilling trust and confidence in Nigeria. But this is too close to call. We do know who will win. We do know who may not win in the elections. That's all what we know. This is going to take pundits <laughs> that send them back to the drawing board in a, in a poll where they cannot say who will win. And I think it's also, when it comes to polling, the toxic nature of the contest is actually making people to hide their hands. For instance, if you are an articulated, you know that in places like southwestern part of the country, it's not fashionable to say that you are going to vote such a person. Or if you are batified and you are in the southeast, 
or even among peers. So these elections should actually depose. We've had like 14 polls, really, that we can say are top polls. But these elections, when thinking and analyzing it, we should think of the US 2016 presidential elections and the Brexit and know that there are a lot of silent or shy Trumpers in this country who would definitely show their hands on Saturday when we go to the polls. Well, polling is no longer what it used to be in any country. Um, ladies, Yemi Adamolekun, direct, Executive Director of Enough Is Enough Nigeria, Idayat Hassan, Director of, Cent of the Center for Democracy and Development in Abuja, we thank you for this analysis. Godspeed, we wish Nigeria a lot of luck come Saturday and beyond. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much for having us.